Joining us on the latest discussion from Washington, D.C., Surab Gupta, Senior Asia-Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist from the Institute for China-American Studies, also in Washington, Anton Fidashian, a history professor from American University, last but not least in Chengdu, Rongying, who is the chair professor at Sichuan University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. So are we recovering from yesterday, everybody? Yes, we are. Surab? Yes, we are, and hopefully it will take time. Yeah. What about for you, Anton? Well, it was a long uh, night and a surprising end to it, um, although not so surprising for some here. Right. Do you think the result necessarily going to make what they call MAGA possible, make America great again, quote unquote, Surab? Well, well, we'll have to wait and see, of course. That's certainly the program. But then again, uh, when has a U.S. president been in the White House that hasn't thought that America is uh, great or at times that it was in uh, decline because of his predecessor from another party? I can't think of a single example. Every time there is a presidential campaign, the opposing party trying to get into the White House, our House argues that um, everything's going downhill and therefore they should be elected and every single president asks for God's blessing for the United States mm -hmm. and uh, certainly acts as if it is still the hegemon and uh, okay. in a, it, Joe Biden by the way was absolutely no exception to this so the question for me really is a different in difference in style not a difference in content mm, interesting Anton just to brief us about that uh, what he thought uh, Surab what about some of the issues inflation distribution of wealth, division among uh, different uh, uh, parties and supporters, as well as the vision for America in the future. Are these problems uh, deep-rooted likely to be resolved through whosoever's policy? No, they are very, very deep-rooted deep -rooted issues. In fact, these are some of the reasons Mr. Trump won in 2016 and that he, that he is back again in 2024 suggests that those policies are deep rooted. They're here to stay, and the and the challenges are uh, uh, will be difficult to resolve for a country which is aging and losing some of its momentum and its pro productivity ca capability. On the fundamental issue that did bring him to power, which was the cost of living crisis, which has which is not just restricted to America. It was a major issue in the Japanese election too, and it is the case in uh, advanced country economies uh, because real wages have grown slowly in an inflationary climate. This has put pressure on the leaders. And this is one area where Trump, he could mess up, but he also has the potential now that inflation is under control, that mm. there could be another growth spurt and that there could be a greater stabilization, at least at the surface in terms of growth. But whether there's distributional and inequality challenges will be resolved, yeah. I, I have my doubts. And Mr. Trump does not have solutions. He just has populist appeals in that in 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 that regard. Anton. The economic question is uh, outstanding, of course, but um, we'll see what uh, Trump does. But he does inherit an economy whose fundamentals seem to be strong, but he also inherits a absolutely uh, massive uh, debt. And that's something that his administration will, first of all, contributed to when during its first term, uh, the Biden administration contributed to it even more. And the Trump administration will now have to uh, deal with it. Um, compared to America's allies, especially in Europe, however, the American economy looks positively healthy uh, for all of its problems. And mm -hmm. I uh, agree completely with Sarab that one of the ironies is that how um, unevenly the wealth and uh, the economic performance has been distributed because the as we saw in the election and remember that Trump actually won the popular vote this yeah. time unlike 2016 the majority of Americans did not think that they were profiting to the same degree as a minority of Americans and by that I don't mean people who voted for Kamala Trump, I mean the real minority, that several percent who are actually raking in money. Mm -hmm. So this is a systemic problem, and we'll see whether Trump's laissez-faire policies will actually 
uh, uh, turn it around. Sirab, we have seen some shifts of, uh, you know, traditional belief of so-called supporting groups uh, for different uh, political parties this time, and it's quite clear. Uh, State of Ohio, for example, and the list goes on. So. Uh, how are people digesting the latest uh, shifts, quote unquote, and changes? What does that mean overall uh, for uh, American politics? Well, I think it makes it fascinating for American politics, especially that category of blue collar working class, which used to be a solid long term democratic constituency headed by the union union vote. And while the union vote still stayed with 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 uh, uh, Kamala Harris, that that blue collar, white, rural, non college educated uh, cohort has transitioned away from the Democratic Party and has become the part and, and has joined Trump's party, the Republican Party, mm -hmm. which was thought to be the party of big big business and free market ideology. So this is a very radical shift. We saw yeah. the we saw the beginnings of that shift right in the Hillary Clinton versus Trump election. It Mr. Biden was aware of it, and that's why he had such a robust industrial policy. Mm -hmm. But the results of industrial policy take time to be felt, and meantime, the cost of living crisis during these past few years just accentuated the difficulties of that cohort and larger group of very average, the median voter. Yeah. And I think they, are, they have become a real toss up and have become the fundamental foundation for Trump's uh, electoral coalition today. All right. And so there's a lot of discussion also about what's happening to so-called liberalism. Uh, of course, all the isms has a very complex explanation. I wouldn't go into details, but uh, just generally accepted the concept liberalism. There seems to be some question marks as a result of this election. Uh, as an intellect and as an intellectual, uh, how are you observing uh, this discussion uh, in the U.S. And, and probably beyond? Wait, you flatter me, but I accept it. Thank you very much. So uh, the question of liberalism is an excellent question because we are at an inflection point in the history of um, liberal and progressive uh, democracy. It's very interesting to live through. It used to be that liberalism in the, the 20th century uh, version of it was uh, a movement that championed the interests of the middle class specifically in the countries in which that middle class resided. In the past 40 years after the end of the Cold War, with the disappearance of socialism as a Soviet-led system and challenger and uh, impetus for capitalism to sort of restrain its most voracious um, characteristics, mm -hmm. In the past 40 years, liberalism has turned into a globalist phenomenon that sure. is rewarding the populations of the countries less, but rewarding their elites more. And I have to say, and if no one's seen this, I encourage your viewers to read the letter that Bernie Sanders just mm -hmm. published about why he believes that the blue collar working class of the United States just turned away from the Democratic Party. And he put it very simply that when the Democratic Party turned away from the blue collar class, the blue collar class turned away from the Democratic right. Party. In okay. other words, he's pointing back to the importance of socioeconomic class, not gender politics, not identity politics, which was really what the Democrats, a lot of Democrats, not all, but a lot of Democrats uh, made crucial in their campaigns. Right. And we just saw the result within the past uh, 24 hours. Of course, uh, all of these questions will need to be further discussed and researched. I'm sure it will come back in future discussions of our program and certainly uh, many other media outlets. Having said that, though, let's, let's move on. Uh, from uh, how to look at the election from within the United States to uh, how the rest of the world is reacting. After all, it is one of it is the uh, largest economy in the world, and uh, the presidential election in that country and the policies of uh, whoever is being elected will have an impact on the rest of the world. So uh, here, I would like to have uh, Mr. Rong, Professor Rong, to join us. Uh, we have seen uh, a long list of uh, international leaders. 
uh, representing their country to congratulate uh, Mr. Trump, the president-elect. Uh, of course, uh, these also include uh, uh, leaders of uh, international organizations such as UN Secretary General. We also see Chinese president uh, together with uh, the French president, as well as countries uh, such as Israel, uh, such as Ukraine, and the list goes on. Uh, congratulate Mr. Trump, and some were even having phone calls with Mr. Trump, even though some of the details is not known. So, uh, Mr. Rong, uh, from uh, someone uh, who has created quite some controversy during his first term in international governance and relations with different countries, to now a long list of uh, leaders congratulating him after he's winning the election, how do you see this interesting uh, uh, contrast and transformation, if I could use that word? Yeah, that's a great question. Certainly, I think for leaders around the world, the uh, change of God in Washington, a new president, even though it's not so new, uh, uh, it would uh, certainly means a lot. And uh, establishing a kind of a, a, a sort of a relations in terms of sending a congratulatory message certainly is the beginning. And I also noticed that in their congratulatory messages or the way to express their congratulations, you see the differences or you see the efforts that they have made regarding their respective emphasis or priorities mm. or aspirations or expectations regarding their relationship with the United States. And also, I think, in, uh, uh, and as a whole, that uh, they are expecting the new administration right. will be a, 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 a sort of, a, ha they are having. And that reflects the uh, the, 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 I would not say difficulties, but the, the importance of uh, understanding the changes or the shift that are taking place in uh, domestic, uh, in U.S. politics. But more importantly, I think it also reflects the uh, kind of proactiveness in communicating, engaging United States, the most important uh, sort of country in the world, in the hope that the change of the government, the change of the God would bring uh, more uh, in, uh, stability rather than the unpredictability that has been speculated. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, uh, great response, Mr. Rong. Uh, but to you, uh, Professor Fidashian. Listen, um, I, I, unpredictability is going to be the key word. We saw all of this uh, from 2017 until uh, 21. Here's what we can say with a reasonable amount of uh, certainty about um, uh, Trump. First of all, he will have a very easy uh, time appointing the people he wants to be in power, including the Secretary of, uh, of State. And we know that because the Republicans have a majority in the Senate, and it looks like, although this is not yet final, they will have a majority in the House. Trump will be one of the most powerful presidents in recent American history. He will, for at least two okay. years, have um, uh, the run of the place. Um, there's a reason why foreign leaders are calling him, because uh, they want to establish a working relationship mm -hmm. with them. Now, the smart ones uh, stayed out of uh, public commentary during this uh, election, and that, by the way, includes the Chinese. Uh, the less smart ones, and I'm being very diplomatic here, uh, put their eggs into uh, Kamala Harris's uh, basket and will now have to be uh, reaping the rewards. And uh, the, the Brits are unfortunately at the forefront of that. We'll see how that uh, works out. But mm. everyone is waiting to see what happens, but trying to get onto Trump's good side. I see. America first is going to be a uh, V policy. Again, that's not terribly different from anyone else's uh, policy, but it will be practiced in a much more open way without a diplomatic uh, filter. So uh, let's all buckle up because uh, starting January okay. 20th, uh, we're going to be on a roller coaster ride. Uh, Mr. Gupta. Uh, foreign leaders understand that there are many difficult issues with the United States and with particularly our Trump administration. It's going to become complicated, the relationship and it's going to be disruptive. On top of that, Mr. Trump himself revels in being a disruptive person. 
So I think at a very minimum, they would want to have at least good relations with Mr. Trump on a one-to-one -one basis. That is doable, even with, with, with countries where he has very major issues, Mr. Trump has been able to strike up good relationships. And uh -huh. that itself can moderate both U.S. policy and Mr. Trump's policy, personal policies. And I think from that re reason, at this point of time, the main purpose of the outreach and the quick congratulations is to build up that one-to-one -one relationship with Trump, mm -hmm. which I think will be very, very important going forward, given, given the challenges. Right. Well, gentlemen, stay with us. We're going to continue our discussion about the results of the U.S. presidential election and its impact on the U.S. relationship with the rest of the world. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The world's largest import expo, a global stage for trade and investment. A place for meaningful connections. In times of uncertainty, CIIE has become the hub for shared opportunities. And that's why we are here for the seventh time. I am moderating panels at the Hometown Forum, leading discussions with trailblazers in global trade. Catch it all on World Inside from Shanghai. Embrace trade. Embrace the future. Welcome back. I'm Tian Wei, and this is World Insight coming to you live from Beijing. Still with us uh, online, we have Surab Gupta, Senior Asia Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist with the Institute for China and American Studies, also in Washington. Anton Fidashian, History Professor from American University, and in Chengdu, China, Rong Ying, Chair Professor at Sichuan University. Gentlemen, welcome back. Earlier, we talked about the impact of that U.S. presidential election on. Uh, the interactions among leaders, certainly the Chinese president has already sent his congratulatory message uh, to Mr. Trump, the president-elect of the United States. And here is what I said. We already read this at the very beginning of our show, but I think it's important that given the importance of uh, bilateral relations between these two countries to share with our audience again. He suggested uh, that uh, history shows China and the United States both gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. The Chinese president says a stable, sound, sustainable China-U.S. relationship serves the two countries' shared interests and meets the aspiration of the international community. And he also suggested that, that both sides will practice mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. He also seeks to strengthen dialogue, communication, proper managed differences, and expand mutually beneficial cooperation. Now, to you, Professor Rong, who has been working on China-U.S. relations for decades, I know a lot of these words are very familiar to your years because they're pretty much the principles that China has been sticking to when it comes to bilateral relations with the United States. But at this moment, any of these words, when you hear it now, really echo with you. It is true. I you have to choose. These, I know there are many uh, of those, but uh, maybe one or two as an example. Yeah, yeah, certainly I think these words are very familiar, uh, I mean, to uh, any observers of the relationship, but more importantly, I, I think for the policymakers in both in China and the United States. What strikes me most, of course, is not only the word, but the combination or the logic or the sequence of these words. I think the message starts with the histor history, the historical perspective, as this year marks the 45th anniversary of the diplomatic relations. And of course, the, by history, China is taking even longer perspective. So cooperation benefits the two, and competition, no, I mean, neither side, I mean, everybody was going to lose. That's the most confrontation. important. Uh, I, yeah, so confrontation is is, 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 is not good. And the, but the most important thing is that for me is I think the three S words starting with S, stability, stable relationship, sound relationship, and more importantly, this relationship has to be sustainable. I think being a sustainable, while we're looking for a sustainable relationship, we need to follow 
the, the principles, working principles that help the relationship. Uh, that, that I mean, the past uh, years, past mm -hmm. decades, that comes to the reason why the emphasis now putting on the three principles, mutual respect, uh, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. And the last but not least, I think President Xi's message made it very clear uh, his view how to pursue such a uh, relationship and in the context where the question or the way of Getting along well, getting al along well in the, uh, as the relationship is facing unprecedented difficulties okay. and at the standard critical point becomes relevant and important. In it, to me, very interesting and certainly predictable in a way. Uh, it's dialogue and communication. Um, now, whether both sides agree with one another or not, understanding what the other side means is the very beginning of everything. And also trying to figure out how can we solve problems if there are problems is certainly the way to go, at least in a civilized world. So Mr. Gupta, to you, uh, how, how do these messages sound to you? I think they're, they're obviously very important things that Mr. Xi has said. Yes, he has repeated them. and one can understand the value of these words. They, they sound simple when they're just spoken out, out of the mouth, but we have seen through the Biden administration years, the first two years, there was so much disruption in that, in the, in that the administration didn't have a real fixed view against China. It talked about extreme competition, had many of its export controls. There was, a, there was the, the relationship was volatile. And then from the Bali G20 summit in 20, November, 2022, to thereafter Woodside in, in November 2023, the relationship was placed within a framework. There was an effort to minimize differences. If there were differences, the, the goal was to manage them. There was stability in doubt to the relationship. The hope would be that this would make the relationship predictable. This took so much effort. It basically consumed most of the past 18 months, and it was okay. a very difficult process. And that is what I think Mr. Ms. Xi is alluding to, that this process needs to, again, be, it, again from ground up, the ball needs to be rolled up the hill, but it needs to be done because it is just that, that much more important in the context of the important consequential relationship that U.S.-China relations are. Right. But Professor Fidashian, you see, uh, globally, we are facing so many challenges. <laughs> well, at the same time, there are opportunities, right? There are forces that are bring the world back, but there are also forces that actually could give us a step forward. Uh, new technologies, how to take advantage of it. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, so what to do with it. Meanwhile, outer space, how to develop it together. And also, at the same time, challenges like climate change and others. Um, how to reform WTO, and the list that goes on. So how, how do you think uh, there's another chance to articulate all of these uh, important challenges and opportunities. Professor Fidashian. Yes, that's right. There is another uh, chance. And I, I, I think that the, the first condition uh, for the United States um, engaging with the rest of the planet is uh, for Trump to temporarily at least abandon the messianic exceptionalism that is unfortunately so ingrained in the American uh, political uh, psyche, especially here within the, uh, uh, the Beltway uh, in Washington, where I am. Uh, the assumption that the United States can do anything to anyone at any time is, uh, has been a very powerful drug for American foreign policy, starting in the the very last quarter of the 20th century and going all the way up to now. And the Biden administration, unfortunately, for uh, all of its good uh, intentions, was the poster child of uh, this attitude. Uh, we can do whatever we want. And if someone doesn't agree, uh -huh. we sanction or bully or uh, force them uh, to basically uh, agree with us and diplomacy be uh, damned. Uh, if Trump just takes a short exception uh, from uh, this rule and approaches diplomacy in an interactional uh, way, 
uh, this can actually make a huge difference. The problem okay. with Trump, of course, is his personality. And the moment things don't go his way, he flies off the handle. But we'll see if he learned his lessons from his first term. He surrounded himself, uh, himself with right. neocons. Then many of them have turned against him. Let's see what happens the second time. Around. Right. Well, I have to say our time is very limited. There are so many questions I have still in mind about this uh, uh, very interesting twists and turns of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, changes in our world. But what I have to note, uh, right after the U.S. Uh, presidential election result was revealed, uh, you also see other changes going on in the world. For example, the Israeli prime minister fired his uh, defense minister. You also see a German chancellor uh, fired the, the, uh, uh, the uh, finance minister uh, and uh, the list goes on. So it is certainly a world that's experiencing tremendous changes. Uh, certainty and what kind of certainty is needed. Before we go, I think it's fair that we invite some uh, expertise from the three of you as observers. Uh, uh, Mr. Rong, would you like to go first? Uh, I think everyone has uh, 10, to, uh, 10 to 15 seconds only. Please. Sure, sure. I think the very fact that China at the very beginning, I mean, as the uh, just after the new administration. Okay, 10 elected. to 15 minutes, uh, uh, seconds okay, only. Okay, okay. I think this, the message from the Chinese side has sent a strong, very strongly is that China is looking for predictability, predictable and stable okay. relationship, and China is ready to work with the United States. Professor Kidashi. If I would say that the most important uh, thing is um, exemplary, uh, exceptionalism as opposed to messianic exceptionalism. All right. If the United States places itself Mr. as Gupta. an example to emulate, many will follow. Mr. Gupta. Uh, well, the most important thing U.S. and China need to do is to see each other as an opportunity. Okay. When Mr. Xi and Mr. Trump meet up, both of them should come up with one proposal how they can All right, we have to wrap it up. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Inside, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on X and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for being with us. Bye for now.